Thank you and welcome to FCA International's first safety call of 2024. Uh, the purpose of these calls is to provide information and, and work to create a community of safety professionals in the signatory finishing industry. Uh, we'll provide you calls or videos on safety topics uh, each month throughout the year. Uh, and if there's a specific topic that you'd like to see, uh, just let us know. These are your calls. Uh, this is your community. So, um, And then I just want to say that the Crest Safety Awards Contest, FCA's annual awards contest, is open. Um, this is the 14th year FCA is doing it, and you don't have to be a winner. You don't have to win it to get value from it. We give out multiple prizes, top three, top finisher, all that, so you can sh uh, show your customers um, how devoted you are to uh, safety and uh, running a, a good safety program. So you do not have to be the first place winner to get value from this program. Uh, we'll have our presentation and then uh, um, then at the time, if there's any, uh, and at the time at the end, we'll have questions, but uh, feel free to uh, chime in at any point with that. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to say how fortunate we are to have Mike Hartnett with us as our safety professional consultant. Mike is uniquely able to speak to our safety issues because he worked in the trades with the IUPAT. Um, so he just brings a wealth of knowledge uh, to our industry and he's a great resource for anybody, um, anybody included in it. So Mike, thanks for being with us today and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much. All right, hopefully the camera's not picking up me blushing here, John. Uh, thanks for having me back to talk to your membership. I'm always happy to talk to the Finish the Slow, uh, Finishing Contractors Association. I love talking to the painters and the rest of you finishers out there too. Uh, so this month we're gonna be talking about hand tools, power tools and airless sprayers and some of the strategies and tactics we can use to make sure that our employees aren't getting hurt by the tools that we provide to do the work, right? As John stated, we have the 14th annual Crest Awards coming up. So please uh, nominate uh, somebody, bring those, uh, sign up for that registration and see if you can get some of that recognition. Additionally, as always, the FCA Safety Helpline is available for you to call or email. Uh, we try to get back to you as soon as possible, uh, almost always within 24 hours, oftentimes sooner than that. Uh, generally, it's me who's answering those questions, but I also talk to the rest of my team, see if somebody has a better understanding of a question so that you get the subject matter expert that you really need. All right, no further ado, let's get into it. I've talked before about an effective safety management system. And that's really how I wanna frame this power tool and hand tool and airless sprayer conversation, right? And each effective management system starts with the same thing. The most important part is management commitment, right? If management isn't committed to safety at each point of that organization, foremen, superintendents, all the way up to front office staff, then it's really hard to run a system, right? If we're willing to forego safety in order to hit our production numbers or to get jobs wrapped up, that tells our workers all they need to know about when it's okay to make that decision, right? We want to make sure that we hold safety as a value because values don't change based on, on circumstances. Priorities do, right? So safety first, tells us that safety is a priority, but those sometimes change. From there, we have program development where we decide how we will do the work. Training, where we tell our frontline how the work will be done, right? We've already deci decided what we want. Let's set those expectations. From there, we go to safety surveys where we go into the field, look and see and make sure that the, what we've detailed, how we wanted it done, it's being done in that way right? Do a gap analysis, go out there and look and see what's actually happening in the field. And then continuous improvement, right? Make this a full loop so that when we find issues, we correct them, we close those actions, we follow them to completion, and then go back to the beginning again. All right. So when we're talking about those power tools, management commitment, 
The company provides and supports all necessary resources to keep their workers safe. And when we're talking about hand and power tools, that means that we're providing equipment that is in good condition, right? Program development, we define the roles, responsibilities, and what expectations we have. Training. We have to make sure our workers understand the hazards that they'll be dealing with and that they have the skills necessary to perform their task safely. Then those safety surveys are frequent inspections that need to be performed, right? We're required by OSHA to perform regular inspections. So regular means a set interval, usually depending on the site, we should have our foreman doing it pretty much weekly, and somebody outside should be performing that monthly okay. on top of our daily walk-arounds, which if we're not documenting anything, it's not really an inspection. Right. So they need to be valid, followed, and address all those issues that we know of. And then continuous improvement, we need to make sure that we are coming around to see that the way we said work will be done is being done in that fashion, right? Ensure compliance. Are people inspecting their tools prior to using? Are they going out and making sure uh, that we don't have uh, ground prongs knocked off of our cords and off of our uh, power tools? Things like that. We need to make sure that we're looking at. So how can you tell whether your SMS safety management system has been implemented, well, your tools on the job site should be in good condition, right? We shouldn't see any with electric cord wrapped around it, any exposed wires, guards taken. We should have those tools stored properly when that is. This third one is really important. Do we have a replacement process? Right, a well-known replacement process within your organization is really important. If I have a tool such as a ladder that doesn't work, that needs replacement, how do I get that replaced? If I'm not sure or if I'm not confident in that process, am I going to tell you that a ladder is broken? Well, okay, throw that 8 to 16 in the garbage. Fine. But now I'm carrying a 32 footer everywhere I need to go, right? These are things that we need to make sure we have in good, uh, well worked out, right? Determined how we will uh, replace power tools that are at their life end, hand tools that are on their life set, life end, uh, and safe tool practices, right? We want to make sure we see those out in the field. So when it comes to program development. You know, there's safety and health manuals. FCA has a good safety and health manual uh, that Optimum and Amerisafe have worked with them to build. And that's going to have programs related to hand and power tools. It's going to go ahead and establish what expectations we have around those tools and provide guidance. We want, we want to make sure that the program is going to be addressing your needs. It doesn't have the roles and responsibilities. Do you know who is in charge of doing what with those tools, right? Whose responsibility is it to inspect it prior to use? Whose responsibility is to inspect tools before they get sent out to the job in a gang box? Right? Have you performed the PPE hazard analysis for that tool? Right? We're required to perform PPE hazard analysis for our routine tasks. So we should have that documentation we should have that in our files that we know when using an airless sprayer, we're going to be requiring gloves, we're going to be requiring safety glasses, we're going to be requiring a respirator, or whatever it is you determine is needed, right? Because OSHA is not going to say, well, this requires these things. They're going to say, you tell us what that requires, and we'll call you out if we disagree with it, right? But they don't give you a document, tells you what you need for these. Right? That's, that's all part of program development. That's the responsibility of the employer. And it's gonna set those requirements for what training, certification, if any is required, and safe work practices we wanna see in the field. 
So an example of looking at that program development, we want to know what the hazards are for power tools. Right? An electric shock is one of the high, this is for painters other than operating around hot, uh, hot electrical boxes that have their covers removed and cardboard with hot, hot written on it. Other than that, your largest electrical shock hazards are going to be the power tools that are being used. Right? Amputation and eye injuries, these are also hazards. Hearing loss, depending on the noise of that equipment. Right? If we have to raise our level, our voice, when we are an arm length away to be understood, then we're at a level of noise where we really should be wearing hearing protection. Right And construction sites, on average, range right about the level where it's required. Uh, burns, cuts, and abrasions, contusions, crushings, puncture wounds. These are all things with power tools that become possible. So how do we control those? First of all, select the right tool for the task. Right? Quality tools are important. Skimping on power tools, they aren't going to last as long, right? And we're going to have damages prior to it. So we may end up, if we purchase better tools with longer lifespans on them. The safety features on tools are really important, including appropriate guarding. I was talking to, uh, talking to somebody in an OSHA 10 the other day, and they told me, you know, well, this power washer is great because I can just get that dead man and take, wire it shut so I don't have to pull the trigger all day, right? That is not an appropriate way of, you, you know, bypassing those safety features. That's something we need to look for. Appropriate guarding can be challenging. Just because a piece of equipment comes out, the manufacturer may not have guarded everything that they are required to guard. Right. Generally, a company will guard as much as it thinks it needs to and send it out there. And when they get sued, they'll add an additional piece of guarding. Right. They let you test it out. So make sure when you get a new tool, you look at it and see if it's missing any guarding things that it does need. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, angle grinders a little bit later because their guarding is often problematic. You, they are quick release guarding, which most tools do not have, and they have multiple different guards that can go on it, depending on what type of wheel you're using. Another thing we want to look for is it should always, your power tool should always have a ground. A ground is really important because it tells the GFCI that there's a fault and shuts it off before enough amperage goes through to kill somebody. Right. So all power tools need to be plugged into GFCI outlets. If you don't have a GFCI outlet, then provide pigtails, which is usually those three-way splitters that have a GFCI attached to it. Um, and one thing I will tell you I learned working with electricians is you should not uh, plug a GFCI pigtail into a GFCI outlet. I've talked to multiple electricians on this and about half of them tell me it'll interrupt that functioning and half of them tell me it'll function just fine. So in that case, I'd rather go with the cautious side because I'm a safety professional. Also, if you look on the right side here where it says double insulated, you have those two boxes. You're going to be able to see that on power tools that are double insulated. And I've seen demonstrations of people dipping double insulated drills that were running into water and it not having a problem. I don't suggest that, but they are safe to use without a ground prong. So we won't need either the ground prong or the double insulated when we're dealing with our power tools. Maintenance is a big issue, right? We cannot just wrap electrical tape around damage. In fact, I was, I was preparing for a client that I'm going to go talk to tomorrow, and they had a, uh, a alert out on their, on their app that said somebody got shocked by the uh, crane power because they had wrapped electrical tape 
around an outlet or around a cord like this. And when somebody bumped into it, they shocked it, were shocked through it, right? Um, so if we see the cords through that insulation, we need to replace those cords. And we need somebody qualified to make those repairs, right? Somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, that does not mean that we have to send those tools out to the manufacturer, right? But it does mean we have to make sure that the person that's doing it is trained well enough to be able to do that well, right? They need to restore it to the original safety and operational specs. So if it was watertight before, it still needs to be watertight. So make sure if you do not have that skilled person inside your organization that you are sending them out to get corrected or replacing them, right? So next we go to training. It's really important that after we decide how we're gonna protect people, right? That we train them on how they're supposed to be acting. So we need to train at the time of hire, right? We should all have a new hire orientation that we have for our new employees. We want to set that level of common sense. If you assume a level of knowledge in all of your people, then you are setting yourself up for gaps in that knowledge to hurt your company. So make sure that you have some level of new hire orientation, setting those expectations within your organization. When employees' responsibilities change, they should be trained on what those new responsibilities are. If they have new tasks or tools, they should be trained on that. And when a worker demonstrates they do not have competency, they don't have the understanding of how to use that tool safely, they should be retrained. Now, what do I mean by retrain? Right? A retraining can be the superintendent coming down and having a three minute conversation on this specific tool with that person, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be documented. Right, or we can go ahead and reach into FCA's Toolbox Talk library and bring a Toolbox Talk over it with them. Right, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're sending them to the hall for a day of training. It can, it needs to be in line with what you need, right? In line with what they need to be able to do the job safely. And also, when we give specific assignments, we should be training them on how to use power tools they haven't used before, powder actuated tools if we ever have to. And if they're informing uh, infrequently performed tasks is a good thing to train on as well. Okay, so next is safety surveys. And there's a little quote I like, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect, right? If you are looking for it and they know you are looking for it, it will get done. What your boss thinks is important becomes important to you, right? But if they don't see you doing that inspection, if they don't see you looking at this, they do not know it's important to it until you bring it to their attention, right? If we're not talking day in and day out with all of our people, right? But a larger, large percentage of us aren't. They're out on different job sites. Then we can have an issue. So we need to make sure that we are conducting super, uh, conducting inspections. Okay. Supervisors, safety staff, you can get a third party consultant to come in and do it. We do that service locally. Please don't drag me out anywhere cold. Uh, but you really want to make sure these are being performed and documented. I guarantee you, if OSHA comes to a site and is writing is is doing an inspection. They're going to be asking for your inspections. If you don't have documented inspections, and the documentation doesn't necessarily mean we have to have a checklist that we filled out. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have a detailed report like what you see on the screen. It can be clearly documented in the notes of the foreman. Right, inspected this day, found this item corrected this way, right? So, I mean, that can be pretty fluid as far as what documentation consists of, but we need to make sure we have that documentation. 
And we should be looking for hazards, right? What hazards are there that need to be corrected? Decide how to correct it, document that, including corrective actions. If what we do is build a library of inspections, pointing out hazards that we found without any documentation of correction, that can really cause us a problem. Now, it's not that big of a deal most of the time in construction, unless you're on a lengthy project. If you're in a project for a year, nine months into it, there's an incident that brings OSHA on site and they ask for inspections. And you have nine months of inspections and a lot of them call out that hazard that caused that injury. You may very well be in line for a repeated or a willful citation. So we want to make sure that we define those corrective actions and we document correction. So other another thing for safety, uh, we want to make sure that they're or for safety surveys, we want to make sure that they are using the tools properly. Right? Are they using the pry bar and chisel? Right. Slip wrench, maybe the adjustable hammer. These tools have specific uses, but we use the tools that we have when we need them, right? So providing the correct tools. If you do not have a pry bar or a chisel on site, likely your people aren't going to use a screwdriver, but that five in one is definitely going to get used, right? Same with adjustable hammer. I have definitely used my crescent wrench as a hammer before in the field when I did not have a hammer available. And this can really lead to problems because tools are designed to work a certain way. And when we use them in a way they're not used to be designed, they're rarely hardy enough to stand up to that abuse. And I'll tell you, if you're putting full strength onto a cheater bar like this, when that jaw snaps off, you're likely going to end up with an injury. You know, when we have a situation with a striking tool like a hammer that's cracked, this is eventually going to fly off and possibly hit somebody. Make sure you're looking to see that the tools are in good condition. Right. Other things we can look for, uh, when the tools are very dirty, it hides those defects, right? Tools wrapped in tape are almost always broken. Now, it's not always possible to have organized storage, but it really is beneficial, right? If we can get those that good storage within our gang boxes, then we really do have a better, cleaner, safer set. Uh, cords and wires. Like I said, this is a huge thing to be looking for. You should be constantly checking cords. Anytime you see electrical tape, on a cord, you need to pull that cord out, right? Because you know that underneath that electrical tape, there is damage that hasn't been repaired. Uh, the ground prong needs to be corrected as well. Oh, my picture is out of line here a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, so power tools. We want to make sure that we are using the right guard for the right power tools. Right. When you're dealing with an angle grinder, angle grinder wheels, the cutting wheels, shatter commonly. It's, it's not an uncommon uh, situation. And when you're using it day in and day out, well, you need to take it, do a ring test, and make sure you're always using that guard. But if you're using different wheels, different you know, grinding wheels and cutting wheels, there's multiple guards for that tool. Do your people really have the training and the tools to do it? Because if they're not where, if they do not have that guard on, when it shatters, it half of it's going to come back at the op, whoever's operating it at about thirty five hundred RPM. It's coming fast. Make sure that we don't have people in the field removing guards, right? Altering those guards is common guards can get in the way and make it so that people don't like the way it works and it, they feel it works a lot better without guards right? 
And maybe it does work better for them without guards. I'm not even going to get into that argument with you. But are they the only person on that job that will use that tool? Right? Are they going to go ahead and remove that guards and be using it? And next week, there's an apprentice using that same thing. Do they have the knowledge of that tool to be able to use it without getting hurt? And do they have the confidence to say, where's the guard on this tool? Right, That's really what we want from our front line. Pull that out. So pinch points, you know, situations where we can have kickback, we need to make sure that we are watching those tools and they're in good shape. So best practices, use the proper PPE, maintain good housekeeping. And, and that's pretty standard for every uh, presentation I give here, right? Maintain good housekeeping and wear proper PPE can really keep you out of a lot of trouble. When we have cutting tools, we need to keep them sharp. And uh, if we're working in a flambeau environment, which we sometimes are, make sure that you are not using iron and steel tools in those instances. If we're working with a highly flammable material, we do not want to be creating sparks. In there, right? They have brass tools that are non-sparking, uh, but that's a pretty special to use. If you need it, make sure that you have it. We also want to look for safe use, right? Are we using the tool as it was designed to be used? Are we only using tools that we're trained to? Are we inspecting tools prior to using? And do we have a good process for removing tools and taking them out of service? Right, because if what we're doing with the damaged tool is putting it back in the gang box, it's coming back out of that gang box. And here, it's a little bit repetitive, but at the bottom, stay aware of your surroundings, including other people working nearby. Right? You want to make sure that when you go out and do inspections, you're looking for all. You're looking for those safe behaviors, and you're looking for those safe conditions. Right? Uh, continuous improvement is the last part of that safety management system. We want to make sure that we are out there assessing how we're doing in the field. If you don't measure how we're doing in the field, if we aren't out there doing inspections, we don't have a feedback loop, right? And we can make all the, you know, all the decisions and write all the procedures we want in the office. If we're not going out to see how it's being implemented, it's, it's not going to matter, right? Then it becomes whoever is in the field does it the way that they feel they should, right? And for some of your uh, supervisors and guys on the front line, that's going to work out okay. But I guarantee you, for some of them, it's not, right? So make sure you're going out there and looking at what your people are doing in the field. Do those inspections. If you leave those inspections only to the foreman, then you will only see what they see, right? But if you have different levels of your organization going out to do inspections periodically, then you get a better look. And when you do find things and you document them in inspections, make sure you document that corrective action and that it was closed. You're also gonna wanna go back every once in a while and look at your previous inspections to compare against, right? Well, we were having this problem last year. We corrected it. What did we do? Let's look back. Well, they did what I was going to say we should do. Well, why didn't it work last time? Those are questions you need to ask. Why didn't it work last time? Right? Maybe there wasn't enough uh, guidance on it. Maybe it didn't work, right? Maybe... It was a process that we thought would work well that in actuality in it were the key personnel accountable for what was being done and are they correct? We want the lessons that we're learning on individual sites to go through our entire organization, right? We want to build up that learning. 
We want to get better and better, you know, building on it each time. And make sure that we're talking about those issues, right? Whether they're in safety meetings or our daily safety talk or at your toolbox talk and training, right? Regular tool inspections. You know, we need to make sure we're doing it. The, the, how do we remove deficient tools? Do we have a process for that? Do we have out of service tags that are in the gang box that can be applied to tools? Are we replacing damaged tools? Right? Do we have that way to do that well and quickly? Because I guarantee you, if I only have one tool and it's broken, most of the time, if I can't get that other tool, I'm going to use the broken one. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, not only in the trades, but with every frontline worker I know. If they have the right tool, they'll use it generally. But if they don't, they'll use what they have available. So it's our responsibility to make sure they have what they need available. Right. And we've opened those communication lines so that they can ask for what they need without pushback, right? Or without getting in trouble for it. Okay, so next let's talk about airless sprayers. Right. So when we're talking about the finishing trades, we have the airless sprayer sprayer, which uh has some a pretty serious hazard with it with using high pressure uh, fluids, right? And when we have high pressure fluids, we have injection wound hazards. Now, when you have an airless uh, spray gun like this, it's supposed to have a duck bill right there where that yellow is, right? It's usually a bright orange duck bill that uh, protects about an uh, inch out from uh, the tip of it. Now, throughout my painting career, I saw that uh, duckbill removed multiple times. Uh, usually it's because they were spraying enamel and it was spitting or dripping off the tip, messing up the finish, and so it got pulled off. Or working in a really tight spot where you needed that extra inch for movement, and sometimes the guards just fall off, right? So the issue with that is that if you get your hand closer to an inch when you pull that trigger and there's a tip in it, then you may very well get an injection wound. And injection wounds are nasty. What happens when you get an injection? Yeah, I know, John. I don't like it either. I didn't make this presentation because I never put the nasty pictures in. But this is worth knowing, right? Usually when you get an injection wound, I'm going to skip this page. Usually when you get an injection wound, it doesn't look that bad. Right? It feels irritating like a bee sting, but it's really not. It, I mean, it's something that a lot of tradesmen would say, okay, wrapping on a Band-Aid, I'll deal with it later. Right, let's get this job done. Yeah, it's just irritating. Right? The problem is when we're dealing with paint specific and especially when we're talking about solvent, that's when we really have a high risk of serious damage and amputation. Uh, when you're using those, about 50% amputation rate for organic solvents for an injection wound, and that's if you go to the hospital right away. Right? If you wait till that injection wound starts telling you there's a real problem, which, you know, six, eight hours later, there's a lot higher rates of amputation. And the amputation may not stop at the hand, right? May go to the elbow, may go to the shoulder. It depends on uh, how much tissue within that limb dies, right? And that's one of the reasons why those earlier pictures are so nasty because for injection wound, they got to open it up as far as they can find that contaminant and scrub it out. I do not ever want to be present for that. Uh, the entry wound is looks pretty benign, not really much of an issue. Uh, and like I said, it's not extremely painful until it is. But 
one of the other issues we have is that doctors don't know about it, right? This is similar to suspension trauma, where you'll have first responders come and give you and tell you, you know, try to get somebody coming out of suspension trauma to lay in the shock position, which they've shown is not a good position to be in after suspension trauma. Well, one of the nice things is Graco offers these free wallet cards that you can have on site, give it to your foreman, give it to your frontline worker. I know I carried one of these in my wallet when I was painting. You can give this to a physician and they will now know to listen to it. Because if you said word for word what was in here, the doctor would be like, okay, painter. But if you give them a card that says the same thing, then they realize, okay, there's some information here I may need to know that I don't know, which can be hard for a doctor to admit. Okay, so uh, like I said, you can reach out to Graco and they'll send you as many as you ask for. Right? Another resource you have at your disposal is FCA's Toolbox Talk series. Right, in partnership with Amerisafe, we've created the Focus 3 Toolbox Talks, and we have one for airless sprayers, cleaning hazards, right? From Hasco chemicals, bucket booms, right? How to do, how not to uh, have that type of situation where the static electricity builds and uh, creates an explosion while cleaning out that pump. Injection wounds, what we need to know about that. We have another uh, one that we worked on recently for bonding, bonding and grounding. If we're using electrostatic or even if we're just using solvent-based material, anytime you push a fluid through a tube with pressure, you will get static. And it's not an issue when you're spraying latex, but you start spraying a solvent that's flammable and that static is a hazard. Right? So we need to make sure that our people have a firm understanding of bonding and grounding. And this is a toolbox talk that can help you get there. As long as I'm talking about power tools, I figured I should probably talk about face shields. Right? We need to make sure that our face shields are in good condition. Right? And that we're determining what the face shield is. Because this guy is foreman told him, hey, go put on a face shield and do some cutting. And he said, okay, this should work, right? We need to set our expectations of what is needed. And when we don't, we get people with facial disfiguration. And I never met a painter pretty enough to deal with one of these scars. You know what I mean? It's just not good. So the face shields need to be worn whenever we're doing anything that's going to create uh, particles flying off, right? Whether it's sparks or chips or whatever, if we have things flying off, we should be wearing a face shield. Uh, the second bullet point down here, secondary protection only. What that means is that these do not replace safety glasses. Right? Safety glasses have much higher impact protection then your face shield does. So if something is to get through that face shield, we wanna make sure those eyes are protected. So make sure you're using those AMC Z87 safety glasses to protect them. Now we have different types of face shields for different needs, right? We have uh, plastic ones and they work well for a lot of things, right? Good impact protection, good heat and chemical splash, uh, some have good scratch protection, some don't, and they can be tinted. But then you also have steel mesh, right? If we have slower moving, lighter material uh, that we're not expecting direct blowback from, increased air circulation so that uh, uh, in hot environments that can work well, uh, but it doesn't protect against fine particular matter. right? So if we're using a wire wheel to grind something, this probably works pretty well unless we're creating huge amounts of dust uh, then we then probably not you can get those that are attachable to uh, hard hats or you can have them stand alone but like I said it's a secondary production safety glasses need to be worn 
uh, getting your safety glasses, hard hats, and from the same manufacturer, then you can often make it so that they're configured right and work well together. That is really what I have to talk about today.